But first though, the federal government gives an update on its work to fix long wait times and massive backlogs plaguing travel in this country. Ministers were out today saying progress is being made, but the job is far from done. When it comes to passports, the government says 95% of in-person applications at specialized passport offices are being issued within 10 days. But overall, only 70% of all passport applications are being processed within the 40 business days standard. For more on this, file Karina Gould is the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. She is in Burlington, Ontario tonight. Minister Gould, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Minister, there has been some progress on the passport file, but you're really not out of the woods yet. Only about 70% of passport applications are being processed within the 40-day service standard that the department has set. I take it you don't think that's an acceptable standard right now, do you? No, I mean, look, as you mentioned, there's been a lot of progress made, particularly at passport offices and for the in-person service. I mean, about 96% of passports that are um, applied for at a passport office are delivered within 10 uh, business days. But where we still continue to see challenges is in the mail channel, and we still have a um, considerable amount of work to do to make sure that Canadians are getting their passports in a more timely way for those that have mailed it in. I actually did some reporting on the mail-in option last month, and I spoke to one family. They applied in February, and they still hadn't gotten their passport yet. And we're talking about the middle of August when I did uh, my interview with them. You know, that's a long time to wait. Have you essentially just given up on the mail-in option at this point? Should people just avoid sending in the mail altogether? Well, I would say that if you have urgent travel coming in, don't send it in the mail, go to a passport office. Um, and in fact, you know, before the pandemic, um, 80 to 90% of applications were made at passport offices. And what we've seen since the pandemic is actually a reversal of that trend. And what we saw since February was a huge surge of people applying for a passport, but through the mail channel. And so what normally would have received 10, 15, 20% of the applications ended up seeing, you know, 70 to 80% of the applications, which really overwhelmed the mail channel. However, what I can say is that we are currently um, processing passports that were sent in about May uh, through the mail channel. So if someone did send it in in February, um, it's likely that there was perhaps an error in their pass in their application and they may have had to resend it um, in because we, we see this quite often in the mail channel. It's why we recommend the in-person channel if it's possible um, because about 25% of applications do end up having errors, um, which ends up slowing it down quite a bit. I'm just stunned by the numbers of passport applications that have flooded in. I think it's 1.2 million to be exact since April. You've processed about 850,000 so far, but that means there's about 350,000 people that are kind of in limbo right now. They don't really know when they're going to get their hands on this travel document. When do you think you can clear that backlog? Well, we are working around the clock to do that. So we have a dedicated workforce assigned to the backlog. And whenever there's any um, availability um, in terms of workers, they are put onto the backlog because we want to clear that out um, as quickly as possible. We're tracking uh, for the fall. So uh, we're doing the oldest files first and working through those. But I do want to say that if someone does have travel coming up in the next 20 days, you can go to any Service Canada Centre, you can call the Passport 1-800 um, number and request a transfer and they will ensure that your passport um, is either delivered to the nearest Service Canada Centre or um, to uh, mail to you uh, with proof of travel within 20 days. And one of the things that we have been able to achieve over the summer is to ensure that when people do request those transfers, when there is urgent travel coming up, we're almost always able to get them their passports. And the only reason I say almost is because sometimes there are flags that are, you know, security or integrity issues um, that, you know, we have to deal with and respond to accordingly. But generally speaking, uh, we're at a point now where if you contact us, you have travel coming up, we can get you your passport on time. I've noticed you mentioned as well, you've hired a bunch of people to work through that backlog. The, it's really an eye-popping number how many people have been hired to work on this. I think it's, uh, you said this morning in your press conference, a 60% increase in the number of people working 
on this program vis-a-vis -vis last year if we compare the numbers in July 2021 to 2022. But when you actually look at the number of passports that are being issued each week uh, over the summer, it really hasn't increased all that much. It's a fairly stagnant number, if you will. I think it was about 45,000 a week in July. We're now up to about 54,000 in August. Not a huge jump, and yet there are a lot more people working in the department on this program. Why is it taking so long, even if the workforce has gone up so much? Part of it is training. Um, so becoming a passport officer is not you're hired one day and the next day you're issuing passports. Um, it's a 12 to 15 week um, training program. Now we have um, compartmentalized it and we have um, changed it so that we can get people issuing passports faster. Um, and that's what we're seeing. In fact, this last week we saw over 62,000 um, passports issued. So we're starting to see see the fruits of that labor of hiring more people, training them um, into increased production. And we're only going to continue to see that ramp up through the fall, which is um, which is a good thing. Um, you know, we're not out of the woods, but we're 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 on track and we're trending in the right direction. Um, but it's it's a you know being a passport officer is um, you know a, it's not as I said you don't get hired one day and you're issuing passports the next. There's a very rigorous training um, process because we're talking about you know the the document that encapsulates Canadian citizenship. This is one of the most sought after passports in the world. This is um, a document that is the integrity of your Canadian citizenship. And so we need to make sure that we're maintaining the integrity of the of the program while also increasing the number of staff, the number of passports issued and serving Canadians in a much better way. Before I let you go, I want to ask you, too, about the harassment that Deputy Prime Minister Chrystia Freeland faced <clears throat> over the weekend. I know you yourself have had to deal with something like this in the past. You've had RCMP. Uh, protection by your side because of some of the things you faced. Are you worried about the political climate in this country right now? And is there anything we can really do to kind of tamp down a lot of this anger or this frustration and inappropriate behavior in many respects that we're seeing? Yes, I am worried. Um, and I think we have to uh, do something to lower the temperature. Um, because, you know, I was saying during the press conference today that you know, we pride ourselves in Canada about having politicians that are accessible. Um, there aren't many countries in the world where cabinet ministers, you know, can go about freely without having um, security. People are often really surprised about that fact. But if we continue to see incidents, you know, I think unfortunately that will change. And that would change, I think, the nature of who we are as Canadians and the democracy that we have. We have gone through collectively a very traumatic experience over the past two and a half years. I mean, the there was, you know, a lot of loss, a lot of hardship, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear, a lot of frustration, and a lot of anger. As we are coming out of this, hopefully, I mean, we, there's still uncertainty in the air. We don't know what's going to happen in the fall. I think we collectively, as political leaders of all political stripes, right? This should not be a partisan thing. Um, need to take a step back and say, what role can I play to be constructive in how we're moving forward? What role can I play instead of getting people angry and getting people worked up to say, how can I offer solutions? And how can I work together with the opposition, with the government, with people who I might disagree with, but to think about the collective good of this country. And so for me, I think it is really important. Um, and, you know, it's been really, I think, sad to see what happened and frightening because, you know, even though nothing happened to Minister Freeland physically, something could have. And I think we don't want that to be the outcome. I think that would fundamentally change us um, as a society. And I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to say, okay, how can I personally help? calm or lower the temperature? How can I help reach out across to someone who maybe sees things differently and have a conversation on a human level? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, we are all Canadians. Mm -hmm. And I fundamentally believe people get into politics because they want to improve the country. They may have different visions about how to get there, but how can we have a conversation that's civil, that's respectful, and one um, that doesn't lead to threats or to violence? Yeah, some food for thought there. Thank you so much, Minister. I appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you.
Here is the video of a man confronting Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland last Friday that we were just discussing there with the minister. Have a look. Christia. Yes. What are you doing in Alberta? Traitors. It happened in Grand Prairie, Alberta. A man verbally attacked Freeland as she was getting on a city hall elevator. Politicians from all political strikes are condemning stripes are condemning the behavior. CBC's Ashley Burke has been tracking the fallout for us today. Ashley, tell us what is the latest on this? Well, JP, that video that you just saw, that's just the latest example of threats and intimidation that are being hurled at females and, and women in public life in Canada that's intensifying. And the Prime Minister yesterday said that this is not an isolated incident, that we're seeing more and more of this, in particular against people of colour, including journalists who are reporting on it. Now, I've spoken to a group of journalists, in particular those of colour, who say that they've gone to police with uh, emails they've received, personal emails, that they describe as a coordinated attack on, on, on them, that when one person speaks up, the next person is, becomes the target. Those uh, emails include racist, misogynist, and sexually violent death threats. And some of them are describing it as a, a form of psychological torture. Um, and the Minister for Women and Gender Equality today, Marcy Ian, she said she's experienced this firsthand, especially as a former journalist, and, and said that it needs to stop. Take a listen. I was a journalist, I'm a black woman, and now I'm a politician. And I have to tell you, um, it was the number one thing that my family was worried about when I ran. Because as a journalist, the level of threats that I got, as a black journalist, the level of threats that I got on my life and the life of my children, uh, to run for office was not a small decision to make. Uh, this is real. This is real. Government has in the past promised to introduce legislation to deal with online harm. Where does that legislation stand right now? Is there any hope of that bill coming sometime soon? Legislation was introduced before the last the last election and there was a lot of criticism around it, especially around freedom of speech, because it really centered around pulling down online posts, which people experts and advocates also took an issue with. That died on paper order and then the government promised that within the first 100 days of this mandate they were going to introduce new legislation. It's been more than 200 days past that deadline. It's back at the drawing board in the midst of consultations right now and it's centered around uh, people that are on that part of those consultations tell me that it's they really have to balance freedom of speech so it's less right now around taking down harmful material but rather perhaps putting a warning on it. Maybe companies won't be able to ampli amplify it. So that's the direction that they're looking into and headed. And today the Minister of Public Safety said that he calls this a threat to our democracy. And they said the government said that they are um, at the drawing board again and committed to getting it right. So it'll be, it looks a little different perhaps when we see it again and as to what it was before. Okay, that's good. Thank you so much, Ashley. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.